You're watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. From Toronto, Ontario, I'm Catherine Bullock. Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace. Today is International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. We have an interview with Faiza Omar about her photography project to help Muslim women heal from their Islamophobic experiences. But first, some news headlines. Mississauga Mosque rethinking security after Saturday attack. Hate crimes spike in British Columbia in 2020. Vandals throw eggs and garbage on Newfoundland and Labrador Mosque. And US declares Myanmar army committed genocide against Rohingya Muslims. And now the details. Dar al Tawhid Islamic Center in Mississauga will increase security measures after congregants were attacked during Saturday's dawn prayer. This action came after a 24-year-old assaulted worshippers using bear spray while carrying an axe in what police say was a hate-motivated crime. The attacker, Mohammed Noiz Omar, was arrested at the scene after being caught by the worshippers. Imam Ibrahim Hindi told local media sources that with the mosque opening soon for Ramadan, after two lockdowns, the centre is now contemplating various options for additional security. For the time being, police have increased their presence in the area. British Columbia had the highest increase in police reported hate crimes than any other province or territory in 2020, according to a Statistics Canada analysis. The rate of hate crimes saw an overall increase across the country of 37%. But for British Columbia, the rise was 60%, which translates to a rate of about 10 incidents for every 100,000 people. Attacks on the basis of race or ethnicity had nearly doubled nationally, with crimes targeting Black, East or Southeast Asian and Indigenous people on a rise. Masjid Anur Mosque in Newfoundland and Labrador was vandalized Tuesday after three individuals threw garbage, including eggs and other liquids, at the mosque's entrance before fleeing. Syed Mansour Pezada, the head of the Newfoundland and Labrador Muslim Association, told local media sources that a man inside the building at the time of the attack was frightened after witnessing the incident. Prasada said that memories of Islamophobic and deadly attacks in Quebec and London linger in the minds of mosque attendees. The building sustained little damage and the case has been handed to the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary for further investigation. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken formally declared today that the Myanmar's military attacks on the Rohingya in 2016 and 2017 was genocide saying that there was clear intent to destroy the Muslim minority. I have determined that members of the Burmese military committed genocide and crimes against humanity against Rohingya, Blinken said. The evidence shows a clear intent behind these mass atrocities, the intent to destroy Rohingya in whole or in part, he said at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Burma Task Force has warned about this genocide for over 10 years now, stated Imam Malik Mujahid, who founded the organization in 2012. We appreciate the formal announcement of genocide. However, the US government must remember that the genocide treaty calls for prevention and punishment. And that's it for the news. High school mental health professional by day, photographer by night and by weekend, I guess. We have with us today Faiza Omar, who has done a project with the CBC, reclaiming public space with photographs of Muslim women. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the show. Wa alaikum assalam and thank you for having me today. It's our pleasure. The website called Reclaiming Public Space has photographs of Muslim women that from Edmonton and you projected behind them a, a image of certain public spaces in Edmonton. Can you share with us why you decided to do those projections? 
So the main sentiment um, behind this project was to kind of show that these uh, public spaces that used to be uh, safe public uh, spaces for us, such as parking lots, um, the mall, uh, train stations were taken away from us. Um, and the idea to project these images of where black Muslim women were attacked was to kind of showcase that, you know, we are trying to take these spaces back. We um, want to, you know, make these spaces places that we uh, are comfortable visiting again. So that's kind of the idea to kind of, uh, you know, put into a perspective as well, how public these spaces are and it might be safe for other um, Edmontonians, but they don't feel safe for us. Perhaps people haven't been following what's been going on. Can you share with us what's happened in these public spaces? Yes, yeah, so uh, I think sometime during the pandemic, um, there is an alarming rise of attacks in Edmonton uh, and uh, other places in Canada as well against Muslim women. Um, what's particularly uh, alarming is that it's uh, specifically black Muslim women that are being attacked uh, at a higher rate than other Muslim women as well. Um, and these attacks are, you know, in broad daylight, um, in public spaces. So that's something that's still continuing on for the around two years now. And do you have a sense why it might be black Muslim women as distinct from other Muslim women who are being targeted? I think, um, you know, the main thing that comes to mind is, you know, that anti-blackness, uh, racism um, that comes together with uh, Islamophobia. So it's like two, these two, um, uh, prejudices are being, uh, are coming at an intersection. Um, mm. And I think that's kind of what's happening here. How did a freelance photographer make a connection to the CBC to mount a photographic exhibition? Honestly, they contacted me, um, which I was very surprised about. Uh, I've been highlighted by the CBC uh, twice before this, um, they see my work. Um, but it was for the Black in the Prairies project, and they wanted to definitely highlight what was going on in uh, Edmonton. Let's talk a little bit about the craft. You are a mental health professional by day, and I'm sure that that's a very training and taxing job, and you did lots of study to get there. So how did you end up with the photography as a side, uh, side uh, what's it called, side hustle? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I did uh, neuroscience and mental health, as well as neuroscience, uh, a master's in neuroscience, and I did another master's in counseling psychology. Uh, so that was like nine years of school, and I definitely needed a, something for self-care, a hobby, and that's where photography came in. I never knew, never expected it to uh, be as successful as it ended up being, but it was honestly just a way to kind of, you know, uh, get back to baseline and relax, um, something that I just do in my home and, you know, just share on Instagram and my social media, but yeah, definitely. It's been great. May, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems that you've sort of come full circle. The photography is not relaxing in the home now. You're doing photography yeah. about trauma and, and, and coping with attacks. And so are you sort of bringing those two parts of you together with this project? Yes, definitely. So um, I, I've done a few social uh, photo voice projects. This was my third one. Um, and I use my mental health skills to ask really difficult questions where uh, the participant or the model that I'm uh, speaking to has to be re-triggered uh, while speaking about um, whatever uh, they went through. Um, so I have those skills, those mental health skills to kind of navigate and see the way they're reacting and, you know, listening to any cues that tell me that, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't be asking this question. Maybe I should go this way. Maybe there's something here. So definitely I am a mental health counselor while I'm taking photos. And yet you have photographs, the, the, the women are smiling and laughing and looking very beautiful and warm. So did you also capture moments of, of crying and, and weed them out? Or how did you sort of get the models in, in that poses? Yeah, so uh, we did uh, two different uh 
shoots in this um, project. We did the one where they're being projected with these areas where people, uh, Muslim women were attacked. We also did these black and white photos where I want to capture that we are resilient, we are survivors, we are joyful, we're still thriving. Um, and I chose black and white to kind of, uh, you know, focus on their expressions and I didn't want any kind of distractions in the photo. So that's kind of why I chose to do black and white. Um, but yeah, I, I have that skill as well to kind of get people to open up and uh, definitely it was, there was a lot of laughter in the studio as well as tears and um uh, you know, that, that feeling of anger. Uh, I don't like to capture tears. I feel that moment, they're very vulnerable and I wouldn't want those images, um, you know, being put out for those of me. So I try to just kind of capture specific emotions, but not uh, the tears per se, but honestly, uh, you know, I, I hope it does come across that Muslim women are uh, you know, very strong and we're still, we're still living, we're still um, thriving. So you know, I, I wanted to ask you about the black and white. It's the, it seems an unusual choice in, in these days of color. Uh, and you mentioned, I think in the website that you wanted to use shadows in order to convey a message. What, do you, what is it about black and white for you that helps portray resilience? Yes. Yeah, so uh, so the idea of using black and white was to kind of remove any distractions. I, I love color. I love the use of color. Um, when I'm taking uh, photos, I love to uh, implement color in some ways, but I think in this particular case, I wanted their emotions to outweigh anything else. Um, and I think shadow shadow play is a very great way to kind of do that. So what I did with my lighting technique, I used one light um, on the side to kind of create those shadows as well um, and to kind of emphasize any, um, you know, grooves in the face or, you know, any uh, poses that they're doing. So that's kind of the idea behind why I chose to do that. I was involved in a photo voice project for Muslim youth a few years ago, and it was aimed to help them, uh, you know, express uh, express their life and their difficulties. We actually had difficulty signing people up because there's a sizable portion of people in the Muslim community here who think photography is not permitted. So do you have any comments on that? And how did you get your people to sign up? Um, yes. So even my in my own family, uh, when I first started out, that my parents were too happy that I even owned a camera. Um, but over time, I think the importance um, of putting of amplifying our voices um, uh, kind of outweighs that, in my own opinion, um, uh, because we're in an age where images are the most powerful way of conveying messages right now. So we're in that social media age. Um, and I, I do believe there's a great benefit in sharing these stories and um, getting people who are not part of our community to kind of uh, humanize us and understand uh, the tough times that we're going through. We're almost out of time, but do you can you share with us quickly uh, a memorable moment or a feedback that you've gotten from somebody? About this project? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, one of the participants was in high school. Um, she actually is from the high school that I work at, and she was saying that that her everyday day to life had drastically changed uh, as a result to all these attacks. You know, she she said she doesn't feel safe going to you know her the mall with her friends, and she usually has to hold you know a friend's hand or whatnot. So I thought that was very jarring, and I wanted to kind of. Uh, push that message that these attacks are still happening. I think the most recent one was uh, in January in Edmonton, um, and Islamophobia is big and real, anti-Blackness anti as well. Um, so definitely, if you're watching this kind of, if you're ever in a space where someone's being attacked, pull out your camera. I'm not telling you to jump into the fight or whatever, but you know, pull out your camera and maybe record what's going on or stay behind and leave a wit uh, witness statement with the police. Um, and unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you for sharing with us this beautiful project. Thank you for having me and letting me speak. Thank you. That's it from Canadian Muslim News. 
We hope you enjoyed the show. Stay safe. Stay tuned for the next episode. God bless.